you can read a novel as an adult and it you know won't affect you in the slightest but when you read a story that really resonates or represents a child it can actually have a huge developmental impact on their growing as a human that is hannah musherbeck a book marketer well she, she's more than just a book marketer. Hannah is literally, and I hope I'm using this word literally correct here, has grown up in the world of books. She lives and breathes books. Hi, I'm Bobby Brill, and in this episode of Creative Mind, we talk about book marketing. And if you've been following along on this series that's been mainly about children's books, you will know that we've covered the writing aspect, the visual development, and heard from the editorial side. And once you get your book accepted and published, Remember, it still has to be sold. It still has to go into a store. People still have to buy it. And that is where Hannah's expertise comes in. She is going to take us on a journey of how books are sold and really how to fall in love with what you're promoting. And before we get into it, please hit subscribe on whatever device you're listening to so that you never miss an episode of Creative Mind. Marketing can mean a different thing at different companies. Sometimes it means just straight marketing, so really paid marketing. Sometimes it means marketing and publicity. That's all kind of put together into one title, and that's the case with this job. I work for the Cordo Group in the children's side, so we have about 15 children's book imprints that I market for. Marketing children's books gets a little bit more complex, if I can say that, than adult books, mostly because you can't market directly to children. It's actually <laughs> illegal. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're not serial companies. <laughs> So, you know, you really have to look at, you know, who is the purchaser of that book and who are the gatekeepers in a child's life. And I actually think that that is what makes it really special and really fun because the gatekeepers in kids' lives are like the best people in the world. They're librarians and they're teachers and they're booksellers. So my job is a lot of talking to other adults who are very passionate about children's books, which is so fun. Tell me a little bit about your background. I mean, you have that great background that some people get very sheepish about, but I think it's fabulous that you literally grew up in the book industry. Tell me about how that happened. My parents are immigrants, and when they moved to the United States, they were actually really appalled in the representation of Middle Eastern people in the media in general, but specifically in literature. So they decided to do something about that, and they started a publishing company that really specializes in representing marginalized voices and international voices, and that was born the year that I was. So <laughs> I was the least important thing born that year for them. <laughs> they, got, they got a twofer out of it. <laughs> yeah. um, so I really grew up, you know, surrounded by books, but we're also, a, you know, a small independent company, which meant that, you know, instead of big glamorous conferences, I was like packing and wrapping books every holiday season at my uncle's bookstore. And I can wrap a book like nobody's business. <laughs> like, I'm so good at it. And, you know, I had grand plans to rebel against this and decided to do art history in school. It took me a little while, but I got there and I entered into publishing about seven years ago after about a decade of book selling. So it has something that, you know, I've been in the world for a long time and almost all of the people in my life I'm connected to are in the book industry. Well, I mean, that's great. I mean, because I mean, we're not just talking to people about books because, you know, it's interesting, but it's it's also because books are important. And you are a thousand percent right, unfortunately, that there is very little diversity in books, but that's hopefully changing. I was actually was reading a story the other day that in Australia, so I, you know, I can't yell just at America, even though we need the help as well, that something like of the top 100 books in Australia sold in the last 10 years, 88% of them were essentially, you know, white people like me were the main characters. And they were like, we got to fix this because that's not exactly our demographic. And, you know, for some of us that live in places that are more more um, mixed, for lack of a better term, you don't see it as much. But in reality, yeah, there isn't as much diversity as there should and, and absolutely needs to be. Yeah, it makes it an exciting time to be in publishing. I think that there have been a lot of conversations happening in the book world, and sometimes they happen right before national conversations, and sometimes they happen at the same time as national conversations. But it certainly makes me proud to be in an industry that's so forward thinking in that way. So, you know, change is coming. Well, that's good. But let's talk first about, to clarify some terms. So you work at a publisher and you work with imprints. What exactly defines an imprint? 
An imprint is sort of a, a subsection, a list of books that are usually managed by specific editors. So sometimes you'll see an imprint that is named after an editor and really represents their reputation and their career in the business. Sometimes an imprint will be uh, themed. We have a book imprint that is concentrates on environmental books only, for example. We have one for just activity books for kids. So it's really just a way for publishers to categorize the lists that they produce. Instead of just saying, here's a ton of very different books all <laughs> under this one umbrella that is the publisher. Here's a big giant book with a whole bunch of books in there. Pick the books you like and then I'll send you some books. Got yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> so for you then as a marketer, what are the types of books you market? What are the genres or is it a genre for you or is it a niche? So across my career, I have pretty much done it all. Everything from really little board books for babies that have one word per page, you know, all the way up to young adult novels, to graphic novels. There is, of course, an audience for all of those different categories on top of just you know, children and the gatekeepers. You have graphic novel fans who are, you know, deep into that world. So I've really worked across the gamut, never for adult books. So that's, that's something I haven't dipped my toe into yet. But yeah, kids is a really wonderful world. And at the moment, my publisher does illustrated nonfiction. So we still do board books and graphic novels and middle grade and YA, but it's all nonfiction. So okay. yeah. A lot what, of what, was, what was the appeal for you to go into children? books was it it was children's books just something close to your heart or is was it something more specific for you you know I never stopped reading children's books as I became an adult <laughs> they were a safe space for me and I, I just carried on you know when I became a bookseller I was much more interested in illustration when I studied art history I really learned that illustration in children's books you know is is high art it is you know it is absolutely, not a absolutely a lesser art form and so I, I think I became really intrigued by children's books for that reason it's also such a formative time for someone to be reading you know you can read a novel as an adult and it you know won't affect you in the slightest but when you read a story that really resonates or represents a child it can actually have a huge developmental impact on their growing as a human for sure it's almost you know some become comforting almost to to, to the kids and they they know the story before you've turned it and they, they they repeat that title over and over again read me that read me that read me that and you're like all right okay you know, I have a three-year-old and, and it's like, oh my gosh, I got to read this book again. And like, oh, but that one, okay, that one I'll read again. That one's pretty good, buddy. That one will get yeah, you a good and, one. and you know, there's books that will help us at different hard times in our development. I remember my first like bodies book that I got when I was a kid, sort of learning about these things. I remember, you know, when my parents went through a divorce and I got a book about divorce and it really like helped me through that time. So you know, I think books can be such an incredible way, you know, to help children along the way. And in such a quieter and healthier way than I think television or movies where, you know, I think commercial gains is much more prominent in that industry as opposed yeah, to books, which sure. has a more of a noble quest. Yeah. And there, there's something tangible and, and I can hold it. I can take it with me, the, especially if you are dealing with something like divorce. It is it is almost a talisman that, that the child can take with them. I, I remember there was a book the gorilla did it and it's an old <laughs> book from i think mid mid 70s to 80s and it's it's very much it's you i look at it now and it's like this is a single mom's book <laughs> this is a book about a kid a little boy and a single mom so when you start selling children's books and you had mentioned that you know you're not selling books to children you are selling to the gatekeepers and to the people that buy books. How are you actually trying to sell a book? Are you selling a book or are you marketing a book? Because I know that's terminology that can get kind of muddied for a lot of people. Sure. So ultimately, my job is to present the book in the most appealing way as possible to all of the various places that this book will be sold. So if that is a mom and pop shop, you know, and they need extra copies to have for kids to play with on the ground, it's providing them those extra copies. You know, if it's Amazon and they need high resolution product shots and lifestyle photography with children playing with the product or a video flipping through it and showing the functionality of it, it's providing that for that retailer. 
historically, direct-to-consumer sales is not something that publishers have been as interested in, mostly because we have such an incredible strong network of retailers and libraries and schools that would purchase books. But with the dawn of the internet, it's been easier than ever to reach parents directly. So we do also sell books. So we will sell them through our website and we will market them as if we were a retailer ourselves. But it's definitely a, a multi-pronged effort. I mean, that to me seems just like an incredible feat that you've got. And correct me, please, when I go through this list of the places you're selling books, is you've got your independent booksellers. So those small mom and shops, the ones we have to keep alive. We have the behemoth of Amazon. And then for parents like myself, we have Costco, Target, Walmart, which is just a smattering of books. And then you've got independent sales direct to consumer, you said. And then libraries and schools as well. The major markets in publishing are are educational, so that's schools, libraries, you know, daycares, guidance counselors, you know, university level educators. We have the trade market, which is anyone who sells books predominantly. So Barnes and Noble, Amazon, that includes independent bookstores. We have specialty, so anybody that doesn't predominantly sell books, but will include them. You've got like Paper Chase or Pier One that will uh, right. okay. are mostly gift a, shops. A retail but store, but that's uh, right. Okay, like a point of purchase type product. Yes. And then you have mass, so like Target, Walmart, Costco, and then direct to consumer. So those are really the the major five channels that we're targeting all of our marketing for. There are different ways that you can market a book to each of those. And some of them, you know, you can't do a lot. You know, if Target's going to take it, it's going to take it. If it's not, you know, there's not a lot I can do as a marketer to make that happen. Um Whereas, you know, for librarians and educators, there is a ton of ways that we work with them to highlight our books on our list and to support them in their uses for the book. So we can create, you know, educator guides, we can create activity kits, posters for their classrooms, stickers, all sorts of things that will supplement what they're using the book for. This year's a little bit different because of the closures of schools and conferences, but those needs are still there. And so educators, I think, especially in their non-traditional teaching this year, have been looking for these extra materials that publishers have been providing for years more than ever. Now, those extra materials, and I'm going I'm to jump ahead because I want to come back to those other outlets you talked about, but those books, the books that you're selling to educators and that section when you're creating things like stickers and activity books and extra things is that part of the overall book deal for the author illustrator or is that something additional that you as a publisher are making an investment in sure so for every publisher it's completely different how they run their marketing department i can speak generally about the publishers that i've worked for usually at you know before each season we take a look at the list and we can identify the titles that we think are going to be bigger in certain categories you know this book it's clearly meant for schools it's like very factual it has back matter this is the one that we're going to market heavily to the institutional audience what's uh, back matter Back matter is usually extras that come with the book. So like a glossary or a bibliography or definitions. The oh, um, Okay, the back of the book extra exactly. stuff. Exactly. The cheat sheet for us, for us, our vocabulary words and, where, and references and things like that. We will take a look at the list of, at a whole and then um, each publisher, each marketing department has to work with the budget that they're given. So it's really a matter of splitting up that budget in the areas where they think they're going to have the most success to promote and sell the most books. So that means investing heavily in the titles that they think are going to be most widely received. And then, you know, thinking strategically about the titles that maybe don't need as much support on the marketing side. When you look at a book that doesn't necessarily need as much support, what kind of determines that? What, what types of books are those that you look at and go, we don't need to throw as much at this as we do, say, this book? Is it a need or is it a want? You know, I think there's a lot of things to consider. I know that editors will consider how similar titles have sold in the past in order to determine sort of where this book will fall. I think everybody at acquisition has an idea of the success they would like for that title. 
and some of the successes are smaller. You know, if you have a sticker book, for example, you're not going to have the option to have a book launch for a sticker book or, <laughs> right. <Okay>. you, know, <laughs> right. Right. you know, or a bath book or something like that. So there are still ways to market the sticker book and the bath book, but it is not going to be as involved. You don't have to really create a story around the creators of the book to foster sort of long-term support for them and their career because you know sticker books are, are they're quick fixes right they're point of purchase they're easy they're fun they kind of sell themselves more or less you know you have your spin on it but it is what it's going to be so for then for amazon i'm and online or amazon specifically not your online store that's you know they take it, you know, you sell everything on Amazon and they're, they're, you're doing a lot of marketing on that or not nearly as much as, say, the more hands-on educator level marketing? You know, it changes every day with Amazon. Um, there isn't a month that goes by that they don't launch a new way for people to spend money marketing on their site. So there are a lot of things that you can do. You know, you're working with an algorithm, which is very different than sort of the grassroots marketing that is more traditional in book publishing. So you're really really playing a game where you can do all that you can to sort of enhance your uh, representation in the algorithm. So there's a, there's a lot of ways to do that. You know, we, I think as publishers, we're constantly experimenting with new ways. It's a, it's a new, we're in a, in a, you know, centuries old industry, <laughs> Amazon and the Amazon algorithm is a very new concept to a lot of us. So, so you know, in your office, it's like, okay, they changed it again. <laughs> Go figure it out. Oh yes. <laughs> But, you know, ultimately, it's the same for Amazon that you would for other retailers. You want to provide the materials that gives the absolute best chance for um, people to understand what the product is. So we think now more about covers, for example, what do covers look like when they're shrunk down to a thumbnail on a screen far more than we used to because the majority of people were seeing books in real life in front of them. So you know, if the book has foil or has a textured cover, how can we show this online to give the customer a realistic view of what they're getting? Right. Because they're looking at it probably on their phone at 10 o'clock at night or, you know, you know, let's be honest, in the bathroom sometimes. You know, you're going, <laughs> yeah, hey, there's a book. Jacob's not asleep yet. Buy that book. That book, that book looked great. Fine. Yeah, it's shiny. It's, I'm sure it's shiny. But no, that makes total sense because, you know, a lot of times we are talking, you know, from an art school perspective, you know, that it's, you know, I want embossing, I want debossing, I want foil, I want all this raised lettering, I want felt, uh, you know, all those great kids books that had felt and pop-ups and, and a real tactile feel. And, you know, when it's like you said, it's 180 by 180 pixels, it's like, it's a, it's a book. There you go. Yeah, that's got to be an interesting challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Every few months or so, they'll give us a new way that we can position it. So we have to go back through all of our books and, and see what we can do to create new assets for them. I do have to say that one thing that I think is often left out of the conversation is how much showrooming actually happens at independent bookstores, at specialty gift shops, where people will go, they'll see the item They'll realize they want it, and then they'll go buy it online and on Amazon. It's a it means that we can't track that <laughs> algorithm, um, but you know I saw it so much as a bookseller, and I see it so much now as a marketer that it is not something that's easy to get data on or to quantify. But we know that it's happening, which is why you know marketing to those brick and mortar stores is is really important and is is also technically marketing to online retailers too. So th when you say showrooming, is that the positive aspect of it where, hey, we've, we were in Pier 1 or a store and we've got, they've set up a, a summer set where it's got the toys and the lawn chairs and some summer books. And I walk in with my kid and I go, oh, I'm going to take a picture of that book. I'll go, I'll buy it later. I don't have time for this. Is that, is no, that? That's or, not quite or what is, I mean. I or is mean, that the negative side? <laughs> it's, it's generally thought to be negative for the stores that are paying rent and paying staff and paying electricity. Um, and it, it usually happens in places, you know, Amazon has so few physical retail locations that, you know, they're not having to pay for all of those things. And so a lot of people will go and they'll see it, you know, recommended on the shelf and they're not ready to invest in that moment or they think that they can get it for a less price. So they will go online later and buy it. So it, it is, it is, 
negative in the sense of the mom and pop shop that is trying to sell it. But we also know as marketers that it's happening, you know, and I think that we need to appreciate that that's happening too. And and also appreciate how important bookstores are within the industry, even if their numbers aren't as high as other retailers. And that, that was my question. So for showrooming, sh- explain showrooming. The term refers to when a customer will see a book in real life at a store and that store will be essentially a showroom for them where they can touch it, they can flip through it, they can feel the embossing, they can feel the different qualities of it, but then they will go buy it online. So essentially these stores are becoming showrooms. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, So yeah, that must be a constant battle for, for you as a marketer then is is, you know, I, we put it in a store, you should buy it in the store right now, guys, <laughs> you, we, you're here. I think in the world of, you know, data-driven sales, we like to see clicks that lead directly to a purchase because for us, it, it makes it easier for, for us to market and to invest our dollars because we know, all right, we did this, for example, and it got this many clicks, which meant this many purchases. But that's not how the world works. And there are a lot of people in real life who are going out experiencing books in the world. And that's something that we can't track, which is sort of where the sort of more old fashioned marketing comes in. How do you market a book to a library, which in my simple thinking, a library just doesn't take the books that are published all the time? That's right. Yeah. I I like to think of this almost as like a grassroots political campaign. We are in political season. (laughs) So it does feel like that. I'm not exactly going door to door. I'll say that. You don't put up little placard signs in (laughs) people's lawns when they're not looking? (laughs) No, though. I think I might be more welcome. (laughs) You know, there's a hundred different ways to reach educators and librarians in this country. Some of the bigger ways are through their organizations. So like the American Library Association, the National Council, Council of Teachers of English, the Public Library Association, you know, all of these are organizations that have ways in which you can submit your books for consideration. So, you know, whether that's getting your authors on panels at conferences, whether it is having a booth at a conference. In 2020, it's having a digital booth and Zoom chatting with people as they come by to tell them about your books. So much of the marketing to educators is interpersonal, which is honestly my favorite part. You know, I I think that having conversations with people who love and value children's literature is like one of the best parts of my job. And so the idea of sitting there all day and saying, have you heard about this book? I'm so excited about it. Give me an example of one of the one of the more recent books you've done, because I mean, I want to really highlight some of the books that you guys are are publishing, because I think they're fabulous as well. Like, what are you telling the education world about some of your recent books? Give me a give me a good example of one. Yeah, absolutely. So in January 2020, we released a book called This Book is Anti-Racist by Tiffany Jewell and illustrated by Aurelia Durant. Tiffany Jewell is an educator herself, so she was very immersed in the teacher world. She's been a Montessori educator for 15 years. And not only is this just like a really incredible informational book, an introduction to anti-racism, but it's also something that I personally believe in. So it it really had that sort of duality that I needed to motivate myself and to motivate others. I think, you know, we can all tell when somebody doesn't believe in a product that they're selling. <laughs> So, you know, I I spent a lot of 2019 going to different conferences. We printed advanced reading copies, which are they're sort of roughly printed, not finished copies, unedited copies of a book uh, six to eight months in advance of their publication so that educators, retailers can have like a sneak peek to see what that book will look like. So we distributed a lot of advanced reading copies. We did a pre-order campaign as well, which meant that you know, anyone who purchased a book would receive book promo or book swag. So we made stickers and bookmarks. And one of the really amazing things about this book is that, you know, I was talking about it to so many people, as I do with so many books, but, you know, there was so much interest in the concept of anti-racism, which was a fairly um, unknown concept, particularly in the children's book world. You know, Ibram Kendi had released 
his adult book, which was doing super well, but this was the first anti-racism book for kids and teens. So there was a lot of questions about that. We got some really wonderful coverage in publications like School Library Journal and Kirkus Reviews and Publishers Weekly. And that really sort of set the scene of this book as a really important resource. I think because of the lack of familiarity with the concept of anti-racism in early 2020, I think that there were a lot of people who questioned, you know, what it was, what it was about. But those who did, you know, interview the author and promote it, it was one book that we really as a company believed in strongly. By the time June rolled around after the murder of George Floyd, so many parents were looking for resources to use to talk to their children about racism in this country. And so many teenagers were looking for resources so that they could educate themselves when adults in their lives weren't willing to have those conversations. So, you know, this book went from being a successful educational title to really breaching into the mainstream and Oprah recommended it <laughs> and um, Ellen recommended it and you know we hit the New York Times bestseller list we're still there you know it was really one of those marketing stories that made me really proud because it felt very grassroots you know I had had more conversations than I can count about uh, this book and this topic and why it's so important in our education system why it's so important in our homes. And so it really did feel like it paid off in a big way. Now, the, 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 the ugly, dirty question, how does that translate into orders? When you're selling a book, obviously, you know, you want to sell the book. The author is going to have their royalties. You know, you've got investment that you've put into it. Are libraries and educators, are they ordering one book? Or how, how are you... You know, and I know numbers are difficult and, you know, this that's, you know, your industry and your personal company's private information. But what are we looking at when somebody you're trying to market a book? What is some rough numbers that we can kind of extrapolate into selling books? So what I, I like to say is if you can sell a librarian on a book, you're selling them on a book for life. You know, librarians don't go through all of the education that they need to to stop being librarians after a few years. You know, it's different if you're, you know, you're talking to a blogger or you're talking to, you know, a retailer who may or may not be invested in that book for life. They're probably just invested in it for a short period. A week at best, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but a librarian, I mean, I can't tell you how many books that I've worked on over my career that will just keep popping up because they are so beloved by these people who are so deeply in the industry. So, you know, a ton of it is word of mouth. If you can sell a librarian on a book, that librarian is going to probably sell their 10 friends, then ask their, you know, district buyer to buy it for every single library in their district, and then recommend it to people, the patrons that come into the to the library, which will make it wear out quicker, and then they'll need to continue to buy multiple copies. So, Got it. You know, okay. Okay. So there is there is a is life different. span to this, but yes. Okay. Exactly. That makes that makes sense because that was something that I, you know, in doing this research, I was like, is still you're just like a librarian. And again, I, that, that, I'm, I apologize. My mom's a teacher. I grew up, you know, in schools and near libraries. So go hug a librarian if you can, you know, with a mask, and I'm sure. But, you know, it's like it does make sense when you start extrapolating. It's like if you have 30 libraries in your district and they're going to have two copies every three years, you do the math on that. That's a nice print run even for a small book. That does, it makes sense why you're investing so much time in just a li library, let alone those other educational resources that you mentioned. Not to mention, you know, if that kid checks the book out five times, the parent is just going to invest in a copy for He's themselves. Buy it, right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so libraries themselves the first are one's marketing free, kiddo. The rest of them you got to pay. <laughs> but yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, there are, there are books. I mean, there are books I have gone out and purchased simply because I was like, I, I can't go to the library and read this. I want this. I'm going to, I'm going to tear this book apart. I'm going to, you know, write in the margins. I'm going to fold the pages and I want to read it again and again and again. That makes total sense. And is that the same for schools and universities? Is it that same idea that you're building an audience for life? 
It is. You know, teachers, I don't have to tell you, will continue to teach from the same text over and over again. So if you can get within that flywheel, you know that there's a lot of potential there. There has been a real movement in the institutional market to bring trade books into the curriculum. So we have seen, certainly this year, with This Book is Anti-Racist, we have seen entire schools buy copies for their kids because they will be having those discussions and they want every single one of their kids to have a copy. So because clarify it, it, it schools normally purchase a set curriculum to teach from. They, they do stick with it. Okay. That's still, that's still a thing. So they stick with this curriculum. It's probably outdated or it falls within a, a budgetary value that they have and that's it. And if it's yeah, good, it's and, good. If it's and not, different it's schools, not. You know, different schools are different. You have, you know, public schools, Montessori schools, you have farm schools, you know, there's a ton of of different models to work with, but there has been a big movement to start using trade books in the classroom, to move away from the textbook and start looking at real live literature that is being brought out every single year. And so, you know, a lot of these conferences that we go to, we're talking to teachers who are using books and they're changing all the time in their classrooms. Um, And if they're setting a text, then all those kids have to go out and buy that book for their summer reading, you know? Well, so. and I guess also there, you know, on the technology side, you know, it's these trade books that also end up in Kindle. So if you've got, you know, parents that, you know, have iPads and e-readers that, you know, something that is easily accessible on a Kindle is a better point of purchase sale for the publisher. And then where as a textbook, you're just not going to get on a Kindle anytime soon. Okay, that makes much more sense from, you know, if somebody's thinking about selling a book. What other things that you do, or, or tell me more about this? Again, this world of librarians just, it's just, <laughs> sure. it just totally, it, it blows my mind, but it's just, it's the biggest, like, you're an idiot. How could you not figure out that books come from libraries, you dummy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, you know, you have celebrity librarians, so you have the big influencers in the community, folks like Betsy Bird, who also have columns or have blogs that they write, so you can market directly to them to, to see see if they're interested, you know, an endorsement from a library at the Library of Congress, for example, can mean a lot for marketing a book. So a book so, just doesn't go into the Library of Congress? It does. Um, it, but? It, but if like, if it has a special feature, for example, like they have a conference every single year and they have a keynote speaker and they have special people who are invited. And there are a lot of ways that, you know, in, in the same way that like we have TV celebrities, there are there are book celebrities. So, you know, marketing to them directly is another way that we reach folks. Can you talk about the difference in evangelizing something that's nonfiction versus fiction? Yeah. You know, I think that um, there's this romantic notion that nonfiction is boring and fiction is where all the action is. And I would wholeheartedly disagree with that. I would argue that any good children's book should be compelling regardless of the topic. And even if it's incredibly fact-filled. It's important that it's done in an engaging way, particularly when you think about the audience of young children who may not have the most extensive attention span. You know, I think that we're seeing a lot more people reading nonfiction in general. We're seeing nonfiction graphic novels coming out. We're seeing memoir becoming a bigger space. In right, the right. World. Yeah, documentary in, in the film and television world and Netflix documentaries are like now everybody's seen a documentary. It wasn't just, you know, nerdy guys like me going, Have you seen that documentary? <laughs> uh-huh. um, yep. Yeah, and not to speculate, but I also think that with the dawn of the internet and with so much misinformation floating around, I think that there is something to trust in a book. It has to go through so many rounds. It's fact checked, it's edited, it's copy edited, you know, it's sometimes sensitivity read. So I think that books as a source of factual information, particularly in a time of misinformation and fake news, is a trustworthy source for a lot of people. And if, you know, your kids are going to be learning better than from a book than from the wide internet, which will give them possibly Absolutely, damaging yeah. information. Another And another, another reason, you know, I don't want to poo-poo self-publishing, but there is something to be said for something that is peer reviewed, and as you said, sensitivity reviewed, and editors and people of knowledge going, let's take a look at this content just a little bit deeper, instead of just spitting it out and hoping it sells four copies. 
Absolutely. Education, independent booksellers, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all bigger parts of my job. You know, the mass accounts tend to take books that are already bestsellers. So already, you know, anything that you do in any category to add to the surge of sales in a book will ultimately be contributing to getting them into mass accounts. But there are also just some books that aren't going to work, you know, in every community where there is a target. Um, so <laughs> that's, you know, I, that's something we also need to consider. Let's talk about some more of those marketing plans and, and ways of marketing. Even, you know, now that we're in COVID, things are definitely different. But what are some of the things that you would do, uh, like you said, the face-to-face, -face, the conferences? And what are some of the things you're doing now, now that some of that stuff is evolving differently? Yeah. So March 2020, we had to sort of throw the rule book out the window <laughs> for everything that we had planned for all of our spring titles. And if there are any authors listening who had titles that came out that month, I am truly sorry. We all suffered. It's okay. We're all figuring <laughs> it out. Was, that was a rough month for publishing. I've actually been incredibly inspired by the way that authors and booksellers and librarians and educators have just completely thrown everything that they knew out the window, pivoted in a way that met children specifically where they were at in a safe way. And I mean, I've seen everything from booksellers on roller skates delivering <laughs> packages to cars, <laughs> you know, to librarians dressing as dinosaurs and reading bedtime stories to their patrons, you know, I have just been so incredibly inspired. So I feel like I, I need to say that first. Um, obviously, all of our physical events were canceled, and we are still continuing not to book them until, you know, we know what's happening. The safety of our, our creators and their readers is really important to us. I have actually seen across the gamut, success and failures in the way of virtual events. I think it's a huge learning curve for a lot of us. I think, you know, being in person, particularly with children's books, meeting an author, that is such a huge part of an event experience that we've tried to recreate that in a virtual way. So always adding something extra, not just having a straight book reading. You know, you can watch that on YouTube. You don't, you don't want to just hear that. You want you know, live Q&A sessions, you want a sing-along, you want a dance party, you know, you want to be able to order the book and have the author go to the bookstore and pre-sign it so that you know that you'll get ah, your signed right. copy. Got it. Right. That um, makes sense. You know, I have a, a book called Welcome to Ballet School, who was written by one of the prima ballerinas of the New York City Ballet, who did a ballet lesson over Zoom for oh, her wow. launch which was so magical. I mean, she's such a incredible ballerina that honestly we were, you know, to do that in person, we would have needed a huge venue and we would <laughs> right. have, it was right. so many ballet dancers at one time might've been a little bit chaotic, but she was able to do it in a way that everybody got access to her and her three-year-old daughter, you know, dancing along to the, to the book. So, you know, I think that there's been a lot of learning curves for our authors. I think, you know, in times of old, you could, not have a social media presence and that was okay and these days it has become increasingly important to be able to reach your readers directly and we have authors doing you know youtube channels and art classes and everything you could possibly imagine and, and how much how much of that because that's one of the things that's interesting i think that you see a lot with people who are creators is you've got authors and illustrators in children's books who are active and those who are not very active. How important is it for these authors and illustrators, sometimes they're the one and the same, to be out there with their audience? Is that, and is that a new thing to happen? I think it is. All my authors, my favorite authors from when I was a kid, were like recluses who would just right. write for decades in the woods, you know, and you would that never was the meet goal. them. That was the goal. I, I, don't, I don't have to go anywhere. I, I'll write a yeah. book. I'm done. Leave me alone. Exactly. So times have certainly changed in that respect. Whenever I, I meet a new author and I work with a lot of debuts, you know, we have a conversation where I say, 
I want you doing what you are comfortable with. Because if you have an author who is not comfortable talking to a group of children, who is not comfortable being silly on camera, then no matter how much effort that they put in to building that audience, you know, it's not going to be pleasurable for them or for their readers. So I think it is really important to determine for yourself as a creator, where can you play to your strengths? If you only want to draw and you don't want your face to be seen or you don't want to talk to the camera, then draw, you know, draw what you would like to tell your readers. You know, I think there's a lot of creative ways to go about it. It is possible to have zero, <laughs> you know, presence online. I, I do think in this world, readers and consumers have become accustomed to being able to follow and see the people that they love and, and celebrate pretty actively. So I think that, you know, it'll continue to become more important. And with some of this, I would call it additional marketing or uh, do you call it standard marketing for on the budget side? Is this, you know, we asked, talked about this briefly before, but is that more of just your marketing budget or is that something that you're asking the creators to work with you on? So every budget for every publisher, for every book is different. So I really can't talk specifics, but I know that in terms of time investment, if it's an author who has a series that's coming out with us or an author who we want to support and launch their career, we will definitely spend time, you know, coaching them and, you know, helping them to establish their careers and a presence online. I have had many a media training and I have, you know, s sat through, scrolled through many a Facebook feed where, you know, you're like, we really didn't need to see your dog's poop today. You know, like okay, that was, that was going to be my, that was, that's what I was going to ask you was, you know, how, you know, so you're pretty involved with these authors going, okay, guys, you, you've got a kid's book now. That's slightly different than your average, your kid's book author presence, I'm assuming, is different than your own personal presence, possibly. We definitely encourage that. And if they are, you know, a children's book author, I think it's, you know, we always tell them to be appropriate online and, and also to protect information about themselves with any public page, but a I mean, lot it's, of it's been a long time since Shel Silverstein, uh, you know, my mom was always like Shel Silverstein. I don't want that book in my house. He's a dirty guy, <laughs> but I like his books, but he's a dirty guy. <laughs> don't go looking into his back catalog. <laughs> Yeah, we, you know, we have those conversations, but I have to say that it really is up to the author and the creator themselves to be building their platform. And that's not just because, you know, we, we don't have the bandwidth or the time or the investment. It's because it's, it's likely that you're going to continue publishing books as an author and it won't <laughs> right. necessarily be with one publisher. So you really do want to establish yourself as your own personal brand, if you will. Yeah, I know that that's a tough thing for people to hear, but it does make sense that you are you are touching lives and you're dealing with with, you know, heavier subjects. And if you're publishing nonfiction, you really have to be more cognizant of what you're putting out there because you are being seen as a, an authority on a subject at that point. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when marketing to children ever, it's important to be, you know, conscious of the information that you're putting out there and also just to, to post with intention, you know, create content that is going to be valuable in some way. I think there's a lot of curiosity about what is the, you know, the concoction that creates successful social media. And so we often do, you know, at Corda, we'll do webinars for our authors and education sessions where, you know, we have a, I, I, I work with about, you know, 50 to 60 authors per season. So, you know, we offer a lot of extra support and education to them collectively so that they can really be autonomous in their own marketing. I think whatever your publisher is putting in, you should put in five times as much marketing. I think your commitment to your book um, will only help um, the marketing of your book as a whole. You know, if I have a call with an author who is just not interested, you know, in collaborating on promotion, then, you know, I will still market the book, but the real motivation to get excited about the campaign isn't quite there. 
So we talked a lot about, you know, marketing books. What are some of those skills that you have used and that you rely upon and have developed it even as a marketer today? What what is it what are some things that you had to really learn to be successful in your career? You know, I I look back at two really valuable educations that I got growing up. You know, one of them was learning about art history and taking into consideration every part of a piece of artwork from the paint strokes to the gesture to the, you know, where your eye goes on the painting to the message behind it and the intention. All of that is something that I use when I work with designers to create ads. It is absolutely the same thing (laughs) as looking at a Rembrandt painting. You know, you really want the, the call to action to be clear. You want it to be attractive and enticing. You want certain words to appear first and to stand out from the ad. And I know it's a very romantic way of talking about marketing and advertising, but there isn't a a day in my life that I don't use that, you know? Well, that's pretty awesome because a lot of people would think with an art history degree, you're like, great, good for you. (laughs) But no, that as somebody who went to art school, it's like, yeah, you do learn these things that, you know, there's a reason behind some of this thing called composition. Exactly. (laughs) Um, My other education came from being a bookseller for 10 years. I have read maybe tens of thousands and thousands of books over my time and learning about what makes a good book and, you know, experiencing in real time how a book can affect a family or a child is something that constantly contributes to my job. You know, when I see a book and they talk about the category that that book is being published in. So for example, you know, a science book, I I visualize the shelf that it would sit in a bookstore, you know, before I decide, okay, like, where am I going to be pitching this to? You know, where, what kind of advertising space is this coming into? What kind of audience will this book have? You know, I've, I've met the audience. I've discussed it with them. You know, is this a book? that like grandmas are going to buy for, you know, their first grandchild before they're born as a baby shower gift. Like if that is the case, we know where to go, you know. Um, Is this going to be like a teen's first self-purchase because like they saved up their money and went down to the bookstore and bought that because it's exciting and, and, and tantalizing. You know, I think we are constantly thinking about this, the consumer in this really abstract way, but I actually have visual references of actual people who walked into the bookstores over the years. And for books, people are usually, you know, looking for, for two things. They're looking to escape or they're looking to educate. <laughs> And so once you can kind of determine um, where those people are and what they're looking for, it becomes really fun to get creative and, you know, to think about, you know, what impact this book is going to make in a life. That, that's interesting that you, you, you mentioned that because that is something I think, again, these things are tangible and it, it's, you know, I, you know, when I look at books, you know, I look at books now as a parent and I look at books as somebody who reads and as a parent, There's that splinters even further in that there's the books I'm going to pay real money for. Better be save it forever. It's a lifetime investment. (laughs) And then the books I buy for myself a lot in the same way too. And I like to buy old, you know, old books from library sales and things that I do miss. God, I do miss a library sale. (laughs) I hope those come back soon. You know, and and buying books that you know I'm. How am I going to educate myself? How am I going to escape into you know an alternative reality? But you know, thinking about that from the marketing standpoint is is pretty brilliant and how. People need to be thinking about anything they're marketing. It's like, you know, how are you, this, this, who's the person? Who, who's, who's buying this book? And I think that, I mean, just some basics of, you know, things that marketers should have is, you know, a general passion for books. You know, I think that people think that we're interchangeable, that like we can market toys, we can market cars, we can do, you know, we're, I, I don't know that I can market anything other than books. It is a life choice and a passion. Obviously, being personable, I think, is also important. You know, if you're going to be standing for 12 hours talking to hundreds of librarians, you know, you have to be somewhat of an extrovert and, you know, confident in, in talking about your subject matter. Obviously, 
you know, the people who have a design background, I think is really valuable and often overlooked in marketing. I think you get a lot of English majors and sure. you get a lot of, uh, you know, of copywriters. Um, communication majors, but there's so much, I mean, we are working with pieces of art. So whether you're creating a tote bag or a bookmark, you know, or a social media post, these are all things that you could use, you know, design thinking for. What are some of those things that they really need to be thinking about to help a, mar a book marketer succeed? Um, I or think, to help their book succeed with the book marketer? Sure. There we go. There's a, real, there's a real question. I think as creators, you are the expert in your field. So if you are writing a book for toddlers, you better know some toddlers. Or if you are a microbiologist who wrote a science book for kids, you know, you are going to know that world much better than I do. So I would ask, and I always ask for my creators, is to make a dream list of places you'd like to see this book. You know, do you see this book in preschools across the country? Do you see this book in every aquarium gift shop? You know, do you want to see it in People Magazine, you know, or if, do you think some niche publication that I may not have heard of would be interested in it? It really helps to become like a microbiology expert, <laughs> right. you know, to find right. all those like microbiologist organizations that who knows could buy a copy for every single one of their members. Sure, absolutely. You know, I always ask them to, you know, in our initial conversations to just make a list of all those places that they see their book resonating and living. And that will 100% help your, your marketer do their job. God, that, you know, it, it's interesting you say that because as you've explained so in so many different markets, like, yeah, if you're, this is, if you're talking about nonfiction and kids books, you know, it could be going to somebody that has a you know, a, a, a membership list to aquariums and that could be 10,000 people and, you know, a thousand copies to that is a pretty nice print run. And if you don't tell anybody that no one's going to try and sell it to them. And that just makes, you know, that, you know, you must, you must drive around when we could drive around and looking at us going, I wonder if they buy books there. I bet you they buy books there. I mean, that's, that's gotta be awesome. So Upcoming, because, you know, again, you know, with anything we have to pitch, you know, continually talk about this book is anti-racist. But other than other books outside of that, what are some titles you have upcoming that you're really proud of? Yeah. So we have a book coming out in January, um, which is called An ABC of Families. And it is a follow up to An ABC of Equality. So it is a sort of interesting take on um, a classic ABC book and each of the letters represents a different type of family and and the message is really to convey that you know all families have values no family one family looks alike so they talk about you know queer families blended families they talk about divorce they you know really celebrate you know adoption anything that you can imagine in our diverse world and so it's one that I am really excited about and that one will be coming out in February. I also have a book called Can We Talk About Consent, which I'm really excited about as well. It is not just about uh, sexual consent. It is about consent in all things. It's about, you know, asking before shaking someone's hand or hugging them. <laughs> um, right, which I, is, which is for probably the, the – I, I hope the, the, the only faux pas most of us make when it comes to consent uh, is, yeah, simple things like hugs and handshakes and a pat on the back is, is yeah, is, you know, not a stepping stone to something nefarious, but culturally in our world can be very different between different people. Yeah, and I think a lot of these books will fill the gaps in our education where, you know, things that might not be being taught in schools as you know, much as we would like them to be, I think that this is an opportunity to, to reach kids there. That's, that's, that's great. All right. So as we close out, tell me where can we, where's the best place to buy your books? I'm going to say support your independent bookstores. They are suffering this year. And if you don't have an independent bookstore near you, go to bookshop.org, which supports independent bookstores. So there you have it. I hope you took some notes and got some good ideas for getting your book out there and ready for print and beyond. Because it seems as we get deeper and deeper into this new normal, the world of marketing and promotion are changing and new skills, of course, need to be developed. And employers are always on the hunt for the next generation of talented and skilled creative professionals. 
At Academy of Art University, you will get those work-ready skills that employers want. And you can study anywhere in the world with our online programs. To request more info about our 40-plus areas of study in art and design, including illustration, game development, animation, and more, just visit our website at academyart.edu slash creativemind. Thanks for listening.